United and Everything Football Podcast. This is our AFCON daily series. And yesterday, um, there were some interesting games that did happen. The Black Stars of Ghana were in action against the Pharaohs of Egypt. And, you know, there's been so much great reactions that can happen. But we caught up with our man Scott Gillan to give us his assessment of events that happened in the game. We put some few questions to him, so please take a look at these questions and how Scott's reacted to these questions. My general impressions of the game were really positive overall, actually. Um, I think as we discussed last time, Houston basically had two choices. One of which was to kind of revert to that more conservative, stodgy style that we've seen from him, where he's been really kind of, I think, sort of trying to eke out results. Um, and his selections have meant that Ghana have had a real kind of lack of offensive verve and variety um, and have made their life difficult in attack, but equally didn't necessarily make them a huge amount better defensively. So that Ghana basically were, were caught between sort of the worst of both worlds, where they were not a massively tight organised defensive unit, but also were, were were really very, very limited going forwards and teams could really afford to just come on and keep the ball and press them. And I think there was a there was the potential that he would revert to that style after not being rewarded for being more positive and more proactive against Cape Verde. But the second choice was to continue with that, to continue with that more proactive style, that more positive style, to continue with selections that gave Ghana, I think, more, or that gives Ghana more offensive options and variety. I see one of them being Majida Shimeru playing in midfield. Um, I think Dennis Odoi right back is another. I also think that double centre back pairing is another example of that where their quality in possession does give Ghana some more options. Um, and I think it's a very big deal actually that Houston actually made that latter choice to be more positive, to be more proactive because I think it really sets Ghana up well going into the Mozambique game because the players can look at their performance against Egypt. They can see that they were positive, they were proactive, they were attacking and, and obviously the players were talking after the game about being more aggressive. And I think those are kind of big, big positive improvements that they should take great encourage from, encouragement from um, and, and they should use to kind of fuel them when they go against Mozambique and have confidence that they have the quality, they have the ability to execute those things uh, and really that they can be prepared to play with a little bit more verve, a little bit more flair than we've perhaps seen otherwise. I thought that in the first half that, that Ghana's approach meant that they were in control. I think Egypt, I spoke before the game, have some had some limitations in, in ball progression in particular um, and that Ghana would probably find it, if they were disciplined enough, would find it fairly straightforward. Um, to prevent them from progressing. But then obviously in the second half, um, Egypt really turned the heat up, which sort of caused Ghana's pass accuracy to drop from 87% to 81%. Their average possession sequence fell by two passes from 4.36 passes per possession to 2.36, which really shows the, the intensity and the way Ghana just couldn't re really retain possession at all and generate possession sequences. And Egypt's passes per defensive action, which is a measure of how many passes there are before they actually engage in, in a defensive action fell from 10.8 to 7.1 so just showing again the intensity that Egypt brought to that second half which which gave made it very, feel like a very kind of case of a, a game that was you know a game of two halves basically but I think the overall impressions are that it was positive that Ghana took that approach and now the questions are I think moving forwards is, is can they learn from the things that went well, can they build on them, and then can they look at where they struggled once Egypt turned the heat up, and can they improve in those areas moving forwards? Because they will have to if they're going to go far in this competition. I thought the major improvements were in the, well, the major improvement, in fact, was in the pressing cohesion of the team that I thought was massively improved. Um, I thought the team were more disciplined. I thought they were less reckless against Cape Verde players were tending to press in ones and maybe twos. Um, the team was completely uncoordinated, so there were huge gaps between the lines. I think there were lots of times Cape Verde had a very easy out ball, often right into the middle of the pitch because no one was picking the player up. So Ghana were very easy to play through. Cape Verde were able to maintain possession, create overloads. It was just so straightforward. And I think Ghana's attackers kind of tied themselves out, pressing essentially on their own in that game. And, and I think the return of Chris Hewton's kind of most experienced and most trusted front four Antoine Semenyo as the nine, Mohamed Kudus as the ten, Inaki Williams off the right and Jordan Ayer off the left, meant that Ghana were 
a lot more discipline from the front. And that then translated to being a lot more kind of compact as a team, the team being more cohesive as a whole and being able to kind of limit Egypt's progressive passing and, and, and ability to move through the lines. And, and I think in the first half, they completely destroyed Egypt's attacking approach. Um, Egypt couldn't get anything going. They had fewer progressive passes and passes to the final third in the entire game in Cape Verde, which I think is 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 impressive generally. But I also think speaks to the way that Ghana were able to essentially identify an Egyptian weakness, which, as I talked about earlier, it was a bit of their is is their ball progression, um, and they were able to kind of control that and then force them kind of long and into the into the wide areas where Egypt firstly weren't that accurate, but also were lacking some quality, especially at fullback in those zones, to really punish Ghana. Um, and so that was a massive improvement. And that kind of fueled, I think, what was a much more composed, tight, compact defensive effort in the first half in particular. Um, and, and, and during the second half, I'd say Egypt's kind of threat improved when they were able to create those more transitional moments because Ghana couldn't retain possession. Ghana never were able to get into that kind of more settled defensive shape. Um, and so Egypt were creating that transitional game, that verticality to a greater extent in the second half, which meant that they were able to kind of threaten Ghana more. But I thought, broadly speaking, Ghana's defensive approach in this was, was a real positive. I also thought we saw a much bigger threat in transition, partly because of the fact that Egypt were coming onto them uh, and Egypt's sort of the gaps in the Egypt's team because of their, lack, their inefficiencies in ball progression um, and, and the fact they were being forced long meant that Ghana had that transition opportunity. They had way more counter-attacks than they normally get. Um, I thought Ashimeru was a key, key part of that, both in terms of carrying the ball, but also in terms of the one-twos. Um, he created sort of transitional, pseudo-transitional moments with those one-twos, even when Ghana were in build-up, kind of those quick interchanges to sort of turn the Egyptian midfield and, and go through them. I thought that was impressive. But I also thought, generally speaking, in attack, it's obvious that cohesion still needs to massively improve, and especially the timing and identification of, of when to release the ball, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later with, with one player in particular. Um, and I do think overall offensive cohesion and, and the dynamics still need massive improvement, right? They, they managed an XG of 0 0.48, which is really poor. Um, they scored two goals, basically, because Mohamed Kudus is magic. Um, they won't get that overperformance from him every single game. They need to be more consistent and more, more effective as an offensive unit, create chances more efficiently. Um, and they only managed seven touches in the Egyptian box. So, look, defensively, big improvement. Offensively, still improvement needed. But that's that's football. A ten, defense tends to be easier to coach than attack, uh, and that's what we're seeing so far. And obviously, the next game is against Mozambique and an opportunity to, to take more steps forward in an attacking sense and certainly Ghana will be on the ball probably much more than they were here against Egypt particularly in the second half Did the coach wrongly influence the game? How far back do we go with that question? Um, because I think you can make a pretty reasonable argument that his squad decisions left his hands pretty tied on this one um, once Egypt did turn their pressing up, once Egypt turned the heat up in the second half, there was only sort of one midfielder, well, one player in the double pivot on the pitch who was comfortable against the press. And unfortunately, he had to be subbed off within the first sort of 15, I think 16 minutes of, of the half, um, which meant that Egypt could sort of press quite confidently, knowing that neither of Ghana's centre midfielders were likely to basically bypass that themselves, either by taking sort of a touch and, and, and quickly passing, by having a one-two interchange with someone, or even by kind of dribbling. So I think that did wrongly influence the game, that, that he didn't have that option to bring off the bench for Ashimeru, that replacement. Um, although I accept that there's, there's limitations in, in terms of those guys in the pool and you might have to be a bit creative. Um, on the subject of creativity and, and being creative in that with that, issue in, in terms of traits and tools. I think the squad doesn't have any kind of winger slash attacking midfielder types who are good at that ball retention with passing, with playmaking, who are comfortable inside, kind of reinforcing midfield, dropping back and, and helping to take the sting out of the press a little bit, which I think some teams do have. And I think Ghana have, have had in the past, to be fair. Um, but this group doesn't have that type of player. I'm thinking people like Forsen Amankwa, Kwame Poku, um, who 
are, are kind of wingers who who also play a lot in attacking midfield and in, fa in fact in Forsen's case has latterly been playing in centre midfield but they're guys who are good at receiving in small spaces able to receive under pressure whether it's dribble out pass out or just retain possession and kind of really move the ball away from the kind of the focus of the press sort of the the eye of the press so to speak uh, and let Ghana retain possession that way uh, they also didn't have a target man in the squad who I think they could have brought on to perhaps relieve Semenya, who'd been running all game and, and ran all game in the last match uh, for sort of for an hour of the last match before he was subbed off. Um, and I think a target man would have been useful in just giving Ghana an out ball, uh, a way to get up the pitch, retain possession and, and perhaps give, give Semenya's legs a rest because I think they'll really need him against Mozambique, but they don't have that profile in the squad. And I also thought that Afori, the goalkeeper, I thought his distribution was really poor. I think just when Ghana really needed it to be accurate, sort of uh, composed uh, and him to sort of put his foot on the ball almost and, and just bait the press. Um, he was just lo launching the ball long and kind of leading to turnovers and making it very difficult for Ghana to, to build any sort of offensive platform. And I think it's in those very high pressing moments where you need your goalkeeper to actually be effective in build up because he's the basically your plus one or even perhaps your plus two, depending on how the opposition press. And he's the guy who will often have the most time and space to be able to pick out the free man and give you those platforms to, to build from and get forwards. And I think when or if Ghana go further in the tournament, but certainly when they in the future play against teams who press more, for example, their next World Cup qualifier, I believe, is against Mali, in Mali, where they will likely face a press, I think it is quite possible that Ghana will need their goalkeeper to help them out and be accurate in those moments and I think Afori couldn't do that um, and I think that's potentially an issue moving forwards but overall I think because of those kind of decisions in terms of team selection and score construction there wasn't a huge amount Hewton could do when the game started to get away from Ghana um, and I think to be fair I've seen criticism that you know he kept Jordan Nyman for 90 minutes but I think part of that was potentially just his ability to receive the ball hold possession and win a foul basically and then get Ghana up the pitch because otherwise Ghana were just really, really struggling to get out of their own half once the once the second half really got going. So I think it was difficult for Hewton. Part of that is entirely self-imposed, but equally, you know, I think there were certain decisions that that perhaps are more out of his hands and are kind of longer term issues in terms of the score construction. I think Ghana have to take the same approach against Mozambique that they took against Egypt. I think they have to be proactive. I think they have to be positive. I think Mozambique obviously don't uh, have players of the same calibre as Egypt. I think they don't have a, a team that has the same threat as Egypt. And I think they are a more vulnerable unit than Egypt. And I think Ghana do have to, as a result, be very proactive, very positive. I think Mozambique are likely to see possession a lot. Um, and ask Ghana to break them down. I think Mozambique probably were more of a headache for Egypt, particularly due to their abilities in transition, the same issues that kind of Ghana caused Egypt. And um, I think Ghana probably will be able to manage that threat a bit better than Egypt were, um, certainly if they're able to be more compact in possession. Uh, and I think they've also just got better kind of pure sort of physicality and dynamism than Egypt have to be able to deal with those transitional moments. Um, but Ghana are going to have to break them down. You know, they're likely to use the sort of 4-4-2 mid-low block that they, we saw against Egypt, try and close the pitch. Egypt were, were forced wide often, um, basically ended up having a lot of overlapping fullbacks and crossing the ball in. goes out saying that Ghana don't really have that option as much, particularly on the right-hand side. Um, it's more of a, a thing down the left, so Ghana will have to be a little bit more creative structurally than Egypt were when they played Mozambique. Um, and I also think that the area that Ghana were obviously very or stronger in when they played Egypt was in transition and I think they're unlikely to get as many transitional moments against Mozambique as they did against Egypt. Um, they can try and create kind of pseudo transitional moments with those quick links to create that verticality but broadly speaking I think Ghana are just going to have to be better, more cohesive, more varied, just in settled possession which I think con continues to look a real struggle at the moment and I think we, we really do need to see improvement if they are going to get the three points that they need to to, to beat Mozambique and, and qualify for the next round. I also think there's you know there's, there's certain changes that they could make potentially to improve that. I think it's arguable that you could drop Jordan out for Ernest Ramer at this point. I think Jordan 
as important as he's been, in t- particularly in terms of getting the ball up the pitch at times um, and in terms of his, his pressing, I think has shown that given Garner's reliance on those kind of quick interchanges to move the ball up the pitch and his importance as a progressive receiver, they can't afford to have him dwelling on the ball the way that he has been. I think he, his link-up play, particularly with Gideon Mensah, has, has really missed a trick, actually, uh, and has failed to get the most out of Gideon Mensah's movement and equally the movement of some of the other guys up top. Um, and so I would look at bringing Ernest Nwama in um, and then kind of being more reliant on Mohamed Kudus and Semenyo in those sort of as those progressive receivers um, and have Nwama kind of as a more out-and-out winger on the left and, and someone adding kind of more verticality and being able to link and, and potentially offer that sort of threat on that left-hand side given Garner are potentially going to be forced into those wide areas, that greater kind of 1v1 ability and the dynamics there. Um, I think remains to be seen if Ashimir is fit. Hopefully he is. If not, I think I'd argue that you maybe have to use Mohamed Kudus deeper, still give him freedom to break forward in the same way, of course, Ashimir has had freedom to break forward and take shots from range. Um, but I think, it, you know, if Ashmir is up, maybe Jordan does remain in the team to be that progressive receiver, but could be Koenigsdorfer as well. Again, that kind of dynamism